So the main thing that I want to draw from this section is to look at the dynamic back and forth sort of relationship between, uh, between intellect and will. Um, I will say a couple of things. First of all, that that discussion in this section is quite complicated. The role of the intellect and the role of the will in how we make choices and how we act is very complex. And on this model, it is, of course, depicted as rather complex. That said, this is a, this is a spectacular simplification of that question. Uh, because I think, as I mentioned last time, um, the question of the role of the intellect versus the role of the will in decision theory is one of the most uh, controversial topics of the medieval period. This formed the basis of some of the, uh, some of the hottest controversies of the you know, 10th through 15th centuries, give or take. Um, and so, again, this is rather a simplification of the question, and I'm going to be drawing upon, in, in my explanations and McInerney in his explanations, are going to be drawing upon competing theories to try and come up with something coherent, cohesive, but also manageable. And so I'm not going to really address the complex controversies of which I mentioned last time, which I didn't send you anything, which I send me another email, send me an email about. Oh, right. Sorry. Right. Um, about this distinction between intellectualism and voluntarism, which is a big deal, but it's not really addressed here, and that's fine. So what he does, though, is he lays out a sort of dynamic back and forth relationship between intellect and will. OK. The question then arises, which is the initiator? So if any given choice involves the application of the intellect, and it also involves the choice of the will, how do they work together? What does what part? And which is the actual origin of the choice? And as you might think, the answer is the will. The will is the initiator of this back and forth dynamic sequence. The will is the self-starter, as he says. And again, this is a controversial view, but it is more or less the conclusion of this intellectual tradition. One. So the will is the thing that does the choosing. The intellect is the thing that understands the choice. So in short, the will does things like choosing between options and alternatives. It also does things like initial act, the initial act of desire, wanting something. Will, on this, uh, on this understanding, is what's called intellectual appetite. So it is desire. It is the way of understanding things qua good. The intellect is, uh, is that which understands things qua truth. So the intellect cognizes what is true, the, in the will desires what is good. And they have to work together, because in order to desire something, you have to understand what it is. And in order to, uh, to act upon something, you have to desire it. And therefore, you have to understand what it is. In order, also worth noting, and he brings this up here, in order to understand something, you first have to desire to understand it. In other words, the will has to command the intellect to think about something. So where does this start? Well, again, he points out that it begins with the will. The will is what first directs the intellect to consider possibilities, consider alternatives, and consider certain things as good, and to ponder whether, in fact, they are good and worth pursuing. Then the will decides that it would like to pursue it. The intellect considers how it ought to be pursued, what are reasonable means. The will chooses a means to pursue it, and then acts upon that choice. And that's when we start actually doing stuff with our hands, bodies, and worlds. Yes? What uh, the, oh, chapter five is what we're doing next, and that's on 77. And what we're discussing right now is this previous section from chapter four, uh, which begins on 69 through uh, 76. Primarily, this aspect of the discussion is on 72, 73. Seventy-two and seventy-three is really the core of this section, and that's where most of this uh, most of this discussion sort of finds its heart. Let's say. Okay, so with me so far, right? So the intellect and the will each have their own roles to play. The intellect cognizes, the will chooses, or desires, or selects. 
There are, of course, also two aspects of willing, which we'll get to in the next chapter in more detail, and they are the internal and the external aspects, right? The internal being what's called the elicited act of will, that is, the actual choice that we make, the internal choice, the, the selection of a desire to pursue, let's say. And then the external, or what's called the commanded act of will. We talked about this last time. That is the actual action that we perform, the choice that we make and actually do something in the world. So the elicited act of will might be my choice to pick up my cup of coffee and take a drink from it. The commanded act is this. They're the same thing, but they're different parts of an overall operation. Part of it happens in here, part of it happens out here. Okay, so we divide these nicely. So if we have the internal or elicited act of will, which then produces the external or commanded act. We can lay out this structure of how this works. We can look at this step by step. And one of his key points is that this six step or five step or two sets of three steps process and which of those, is, we'll get to it. This process is a kind of back and forth itself. It is, it is itself a kind of dynamic because we begin, we begin up here, then we go down in the planning process and then back up in the process of execution. So the order of intention or the order of desire is the inverse of the order of action. And we'll look at exactly what that means once we've laid out the steps in the process. But just keep that in mind that this is a sort of back and forth kind of a process. All right, so to begin, the first step in the elicited act of will is the act of will. Will in this sense, qua intellectual appetite, desire. So the act of will is to desire, smelling, some end or some good. That's where we begin. The first step in the deliberative process is to notice that there is something good that I want. To take a concrete example, we can go with my cup of coffee. I notice that, ah, coffee, mmm. Okay. So I've noticed that there is something and that this, that something is desirable because there is something good about it. Okay. The next step is what he calls the enjoyment of that object, the enjoyment or the delight in the object, which at this stage is purely hypothetical. If this is the, act, the action of the will, we've passed it over to the intellect. The intellect now cognizes what is good about it. What desire would this fulfill? Quoting, he says, in this fashion, enjoyment looks to the end. The end is considered as that which would make desire cease. So considering, uh, so the enjoyment of the good that we are considering is understanding what desire it will fulfill. It is, it is the cognition of what achieving the end, what good that will do. So this is understanding qua good, or we can say or qua fulfilling. So first we notice something, mm, good, coffee. Then we intellectually enjoy it. We think, all right, well, what, what is worth pursuing about this? 
What ends that I have will this satisfy? It will quench my thirst, it will provide me energy, and it will allow me to continue speaking clearly and coherently by hydrating my throat. Right? An array of goods that this will fulfill. So I haven't just noticed it, 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 noticed it and been sort of attracted to it by desire. What has happened here is a further step. I have understood what it is about this that will fulfill me. Okay. Then we have the transition bit from internal to external. We have the intention. I say this is the transition from the elicited act to the commanded act, from the internal to the external, because the intention is selecting an end. So we have selected this particular good as an end to pursue. This is the choice. This is the choice being made. I have chosen to pursue this good that I have understood and that I have cognized and that I have, uh, that I have intellectually enjoyed. I've chosen to pursue it as an end that I would like to, uh, that I would like to fulfill. Okay. So once we have the end in mind, we've formed an intention, we have to pursue that end. And how we do that is, once again, it begins with, uh, this is back to an intellectual process. Uh, the next step is what is referred to as consent. Which is considering, or the consideration, of possible, of possible means. So, we form an intention. I intend to take a drink from my coffee. Hmm. Don't clap. This, is, this was a bad idea, this was a bad choice. I should not have done this. Anyway, I have uh, intended to take a drink of coffee, right? All right, this is what I'm planning to do. My intellect then considers, all right, what are the various things that I could do that may be conducive to that end? Or may not be. So I might think of the various actions that I could perform that might be conducive to that end. I could, for instance, reach out with my hand, pick it up, and take a sip from it. Simple enough. I could um, set it on top of the, the Pringle can uh, microphone thingy, uh, is such that it is rather precarious and about to fall over. I could pick it up and hurl it at one of you. I could go down the hall and refill it before I continue drinking. Okay, of all of these various options, some of them are conducive to the end I am pursuing. They fit with my intention. Others do not. For example, placing it here is partially conducive to me taking a sip from it. It's not preventing me from doing so, but it's not helpful. So my intellect then presents that to the will and says, yeah, you can do that, but it's not gonna help much. It also might say, yes, you could in fact go refill it. That'll make your coffee nice and warm. It'll make it nice and full, and that will be helpful. That is a way of pursuing this intention. It might also say, yes, you can just take it and drink it. There's still some in there. There's still some to drink. It is still nice and warm. It's not scalding hot, but it's still of a potable temperature. You should go ahead and that is an option. You can go ahead and drink it. The intellect also considers the possibility of me picking up the coffee cup and just hurling it at a random student, right? The intellect decides that, or understands that that is in no way conducive to the end that I have selected. That is not going to get coffee from the cup into my throat. It is going to get it instead all over all of you and me fired. That's how this is going to work. And so the intellect, excludes this as an option and does not consent to it as a means because it is, an, it is a means that is inappropriate to the end that we have selected. So the intellect at this stage considers all of the various possible actions and it presents them to the will as either good option, less good option, not an option. With me so far? 
So here, at this stage, we have a bunch of options. There are a bunch of ways that I could pursue my intention, that I could do this thing that I'm intending to do. And then finally, we have the use of some means. Which is the selection and application of a means. We would say of a proximate means. And I say proximate, keeping in mind that this is a term that comes up in the next chapter. Proximate here just means immediate. It is the first means if there is a series of means. Right, if I need to do something to get something else, to get something else, to get something else, to achieve my end, the use, this step, is the first step in that process. Right? Suppose, right, my end is to have a drink of coffee. Right? If we're to break down our actions to a pedantic level of detail, that may involve me reaching forward, grasping the handle, picking it up, bringing it to my face, and taking a sip. Right? the most proximate means of doing that was reaching forward, right? Reaching out to grab it and being careful not to knock it over. Right. The more remote means are bringing it towards my face, tipping it backwards. If we're to really break down our actions into, into little subtle parts. Now we could also just say that the action was grabbing the coffee and taking a sip. Taking a sip. That, that could reasonably describe as one action because it was all one intention. It was all this. We can also say that perhaps that my, uh, my intention to drink a coffee was for some further end. It was for the purpose of teaching this class, using this as an example. And that itself is for some further end of teaching about ethics. And that itself is for some further end of helping you to develop in your, your academics or whatever it might be. Right? All sorts of reasons I might have, some further ends that I might have. And so the use is some proximate means, some immediate thing, some, the first step along this process. And this, so we've gone all the way down here and we've done this planning stage and we've now executed our action, now we go back up. So we use some proximate means. Now we deliberate further as to what further means do I need to, uh, to achieve the intended outcome. Are there any other further means to achieve the intended outcome or are we done? The will passes it back to the intellect, so to speak. The intellect now considers, what's next? Is there a next step, or are we done, and do we need to find some other good to desire? If there is some next step, then we go and we use that next step. We apply it until we've fulfilled our intention. When we've done the thing that we intended to do, then our desire has been fulfilled, which is the enjoyment of the thing. We've gone back upwards, and now our desire, our will for that thing has ceased. Now that I have had a sip of coffee, for now at least, my desire for it has been alleviated and I no longer particularly desire the thing that I set out to desire. So we start off with some desire, we go down, we intend, we plan, we execute, we fulfill our intention, we enjoy the end, and we no longer desire it. We go down, then we go back up. Okay, we, got, we have a pretty good idea of this dynamic process. Any questions as to any of these steps, how any of this works? I could have also color-coded this different in terms of intellect and will, but I'm out of colors. So will, intellect, both intellect, will. More will, but the intention's a little bit of both. All right, pretty good? Questions on this stuff? Maybe. Okay. If not, next question for considering. Another distinction I want to make. And this is not one that he makes very explicitly here, but he does make use of this distinction, both here and in the next chapter. So I will uh, I'll lay it out here. And this is one that we find um, more coherently and uh, more carefully distinguished here. This is in Anselm's On the, uh, on the Fall of the Devil. Uh, and that is between three responses that the will can have to some particular good. In Seven minutes. We got time. I can do this. <laughs> and that is to will. And actually, you know what? Switch colors. To will 
to not will, obviously. And to will against. Okay. Simple enough. To will something, as we've gone over from the last section, is to desire something, is to, to have a particular um, uh, desire for that thing qua good. You understand what is good for it and you want that good. Okay. These two are a little harder to distinguish. Based on either this reading or based on simply understanding the terms, what's the difference between them? Any ideas on this matter? Uh, not will meaning is not doing it or then doing it. Okay. Fair enough. So what's willing against? What's the difference there? You intend to go against something. Yeah, more or less. So the difference between not willing and willing against is whether you simply do not have a desire for something or whether you have an aversion to it. Okay, so for example, suppose I were to offer you an option for dessert. You can have any one of three options. You can have cake, you can have pie, you can have cat poop. How many of you would choose cake of the three options? Anyway, okay. How many of you would choose pie? How many of you would choose cat poop? Okay, so you have a different reaction to each of these. You may have a will for one of these, for one of these, let's say three, I wrote it down to two realistically, because no one chose cat poop because you're all sane. Some of you may have preferred pie, so you've willed pie, but you've not willed cake. You've not willed against it. Because if pie were, were off the table, so to speak, and I had just offered you a piece of cake, you might have said, oh, well, yes, thank you, right? You might have. You might not have, right? You might have willed to reject it. You might dislike cake. That's possible, too. But for most of us, right, if you've given the choice between two things that we, that we at least like to some degree, that we would want to some degree, you don't usually will against one of them. You don't will to reject one in favoring the other. You just want one and don't care so much, as much for the other one, let's say. Contrast this with cat poop. You will against it. You want it away from you. You reject it outright. Okay, with me so far? This is going to be important in the next chapter, but we'll get to that. Probably Thursday. Um, Okay, so now it gets more complicated because any time that you either not will or will against, you in fact do both. What matters is the order in which you do them. Anselm uses its examples here, there and there, um, the two last paragraphs here, where you first will, uh, where you first not will something and then will against it. This is the clearer example. So. He gives the example, suppose you were handed a live coal, so something that is on fire, practically speaking, and you're handed it. What do you do? Drop it. You get rid of it, right? You will to get rid of it. You will to reject the thing. But he wants to draw our attention to something. That what happens before that? You didn't yeah, you don't want it. That's why you want to get rid of it. First, you do not will it. Then you will against it. Because you can think of alternatives, even though you might will against it, you might will to get rid of this hot burning coal, you might will to possess it more. I have an example of this from real history, names I will not name, but, uh, I, and it's not a coal, it's dry ice, but it's roughly the same. So ordinarily, if you're handed a piece of dry ice into your bare hand, you would reject it, right? Okay, suppose instead you were in the 18 to 24 year old demographic and you were uh, one of two brothers and these two brothers decided that a good that they were pursuing is to see who could hold on to a piece of dry ice longer. This happened to me in college. I have no brothers. This happened to friends of mine who, uh, who had more courage than sense, let's say. Um, and they valued the, um, 
<laughs> the ability to overcome one's brother far more than they valued the use of their right hand for the next two to three weeks. And so they both decided to place a piece of dry ice in their palm and hold on to it until they could no longer do so. I don't remember who won, but I know for sure that they both lost. Sure does. They had massive blisters on their hands for several weeks after this. This was a bad idea. Please do not try this at home or anywhere else. It was. Both of them. Because they wanted to prove that they were the more badass of the brothers. Both of them did. And they both, like I said, lost horribly. This was really, really dumb. But, you know, 18 to 24 year old brothers tend to do this sort of thing. Especially when they are both within that key demographic. Anyway. You might, in other words, desire something more than you are averse to it. Take the cat poop example. You may will to clean your cat's litter box more than you are averse to picking up cat litter with a scoop with poop in it. You may will something that you are averse to. Hmm, perfectly reasonable. OK, flip this. Contrary, the other way. God, we're so low on time. We can do this. So contrary. Oh, yeah, we have, we, have, we have a half an hour. Oh, I have time. I have time. I don't need to rush as much. Thank you. Still going to rush a little bit because, you know, we have a lot to cover, but. Did I just leave the class a bit longer? I was about to end. I don't know why. I, I didn't think this through. Anyway, regardless. So you may not simply not will something. But the reason you do not will it is because you first willed against it. This is the cake and pie example. So he uses the example, Anselm uses the example, of exchanging money for a piece of bread. Right? You have money. You want to keep it. You have a will to retain it. But you want the thing that you want to buy more than you want the money in your hand. So by willing something else more, first you will to relinquish the money that you have. Right? You still want to keep it. But you want to get rid of it more, because there's something else you want more so. You will against. You will to reject the money that you have first. Then, once you've received the thing in exchange, in this case, the loaf of bread, you no longer will to retain the money that you've given up, because your desire for something else has been fulfilled. Take the cake and pie example. If you're given the choice between cake and pie, you select pie. It's not that you are averse to cake. Maybe you are, but most of us are not particularly averse to, to cake as a dessert option. It's not that you initially reject it. You do reject it, but only because you have accepted the alternative. And you no longer desire this thing. Your desire for it goes away. You no longer will it. You suddenly not will the thing because you have first willed to reject it. Okay. So. If we map this onto our prior structure, once we've formed an intention, say choosing pie over cake, the will presents, or sorry, the intellect presents various options to consent to. The preferred option will turn out to be the rejection of cake in favor of pie. And so the will wills against cake, not because it innately dislikes it but because it is a dispreferred option. It's an opportunity cost, so to speak, in, in like economic terms. You will against it because it is the dispreferred thing, and you prefer something else more. Then, by selecting this rather than that, by selecting pie rather than cake, you no longer will cake because you have pie, which is something that you wanted more. Bless you. OK, make sense? All right. Any other questions on this section? Or on this little bit of Anselm that we've been looking at? Or this latter section of. Uh... Uh, what is that where was Anselm going with this? Oh, uh, with this? Yeah. Oh, it was, uh, it was how and why um, Satan chose um, to reject God. Fascinating question. And again, the reason that he uses this as an example and as a sort of thought experiment is because uh, angels, so whether angels or devils ultimately, but angels as a kind of creature, are far more simple 
uh, in terms of thought experiments than human beings are. We, we pass through time by duration. This happens, then that happens. We have things like bodily temptations. Angels are purely immaterial and have a unique relationship to time such that they make precisely one choice and that singular choice is what determines everything that they do throughout the course of eternity. Right? They are what's called aveternal is the technical term for it, which you don't need to remember that. But because of that, because they make precisely one choice and it is a pure choice unaffected by, say, um, physical temptations and, and bodily desires and things like that, it's very easy to consider the 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 primal angelic choice on its own in isolation without having to, to deal with things like temptation, things like, things like uh, the progression of time, wanting this thing then changing one's mind because it doesn't work like that. So once you can figure out exactly how the mechanics of choice work in the simple case, then you can go on to apply it, apply that knowledge that you've gained to more complex cases. Right. So it works, so using the, uh, the why did Satan fall example, to analyze choice and particularly sin, it works really well in the same way that physics experiments, or at least hypothetical physics experiments in a frictionless vacuum work quite well for figuring out basic principles uh, of, you know, of physics. Right? Even though there's no such thing as a frictionless vacuum, and even though there's no such thing as a human choice which is absent any duration or, or, or uh, physicality or anything like that, Understanding the pure act of the intellect and will and how they cooperate and discooperate, whatever, you get, it, you get what I'm saying. Understanding that on its own helps us to apply that knowledge to more concrete and, and complex situations. Make sense? Yeah. The medievals loved talking about angels for precisely this reason. Not because they are, you know, the, the angelic choices are particularly applicable or particularly useful to our everyday lives but because they lend a lot of insight to the very basic building blocks for how we understand ourselves. 